Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I really admire that Steve, with this uh, conference, and Brian and Anne Marie, have thought to bring environment into the issue of human health and a holistic thinking in really a very, very bold and uh, extreme way, which is to say, let's look at the planet as well. A lot of people say that, but they may not understand the implications of that. And we are in a new era. The reason I picked sea level rise in particular is sea level rise proves climate change because we don't think about it, but the size of the ice on the planet, the ice sheets, changes over geologic time. It's been stable for a few thousand years, as I'm going to explain to you. But the height of the ocean, which reflects the amount of ice we have on the planet, is proof of long-term climate change. It's a different way of looking at it, but it's also one of the biggest impacts as sea level change is going to change where we live in real estate. So it gets very, very personal, but it's over a long time frame. So I try and help people see a big picture. And I walk, we're going to allow time for a few questions at the end because I always welcome that. My book came out two and a half years ago, and uh, it was the week of Hurricane Sandy, and it was a very terrible event, but very fortuitous timing because I actually described an event exactly like Sandy hitting Atlantic City in New York City the week before it happened. So I got on television and so on, and they said, Mr. Englander, how did you possibly predict this, you know, week before it happened, and I didn't predict it. I was describing one of many scenarios about what would inevitably happen. I had no idea it could happen with that kind of timing, but it made it very powerful. There's a lot of confusion about sea level rise. Um, most people think that the melting polar ice cap, we tend to associate with the polar bear habitat, and people are justifiably concerned about that. It's really somewhat irrelevant to sea level rise because as the ice melts in the Arctic, it doesn't affect sea level. And that surprises people, but it's a simple fact. It's like ice cubes in a glass. If you take a glass with iced tea or gin and tonic or whatever you like and look at the level of, of liquid, and if there's floating ice cubes in it and mark the level of the glass, it won't change as the ice melts, even though there's 10% above the surface, just like an iceberg. That ice is floating. The problem is different, and we're going to get to that in a minute. It's the glaciers on land and thermal expansion of seawater and some other things. But first, let's put things in a bigger perspective and get rid of other points of confusion. We tend to look at unusual storms, which are most likely associated with climate change, global warming. And uh, those manifest themselves like Sandy. There's other events, even no-name storms that are now flooding. This is a street in Fort Lauderdale, the beachfront uh, main road there. And it was underwater a month after Sandy during the no-name storm, the Thanksgiving storm of 2012. These are showing us what things will look like when sea level rises maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now. It's a revolutionary view. But there's some big differences. Sea level, is not, sea level rise is not like a storm surge. It helps us to visualize it, but the difference is sea level rise will be global and it's not going to recede for a thousand years or longer. So it's effectively permanent. And the impact zone is bigger. So this is revolutionary thinking. And just like we need to think differently about our bodies and our health and what we put into it and how we take care of ourselves, we need to think of the planet differently. And it's different than we thought of it 50 years ago in terms of what the threats are. We're at 7 billion people, we're headed to 10 billion, we've changed the atmosphere, the ice caps are melting, sea level's rising, we need a bigger view, and that's what I try and give people. Now, to give you a very down-to-earth residential example, there's coastal communities all over the world where they put in storm drains so that during extreme rainfall events that extra water would be diverted to some waterway or some other system. Well, every 28 days in this neighborhood in Broward County, but I could show you places from around the world, the water backs up. That's salt water. Now, when that community was created 50 years ago, that didn't happen. The sea level down there is about 14 inches higher than it was a century ago. And that's not a storm event. That's predictable by the tide cycle, by the alignment of the planets, the full moon. That's what determines an extreme high tide. 
It was a cover of National Geographic a year and a half ago, September 2013. And it made the point that when all the ice melts, how high sea level will be. I, I know some of them read my book, and it's interesting because the first sentence of my book says the same point, that when all the ice on the planet melts, sea level will be 212 feet higher, which is exactly what they're depicting against the Statue of Liberty to show us a reference point. Now, I think actually, as I said to one of you this morning before the talk, in a way that's a, uh, a message that distracts us because that's not going to happen for 500 years, maybe a couple of thousand years, melting all the ice. So there's no point in stressing ourselves and panicking over something which is not imminent. But it does allow us to think through that we are in a different era and something different than all human civilization. Sea level hasn't changed much in 5,000 years, which is pretty much the length of our human civilization. Five, six, eight thousand years, our written record, ancient religious texts, however you want to characterize it. But civilization, just for round figures, is a five or six thousand year period. The Chinese calendar, the Jewish calendar, whatever construct you want to use to define when we became civilized. But the last time sea level was higher was 120,000 years ago. And I want to give you that geologic perspective today because it's rock solid. No pun intended. And people say, well, this has happened before. Climate's a natural thing. There's a natural cycle. They're absolutely right. They just have no clue about the time periods that are involved. And it's very, it's irrefutable. I have done this talk now for two and a half years. I do it professionally. I help not only companies and communities and governments, both national security and foreign governments, try and understand what does this mean, that this is a paradigm change. This changes the baseline. This is not like flooding. Flooding is temporary. This is submergence. This is catastrophic coastline change, something we've never contemplated. One of the best places to illustrate that happens to be the state we're in presently, Florida. I show this slide all over the world because people all recognize the shape of Florida. 20,000 years ago, during the peak of the last ice age, when a lot more ice was locked up on the continents, sea level was down 390 feet and Florida was twice the size. Because particularly the shallow banks off to the west were dry. Now, if we went back to the last warm spot in the geologic cycle, and I'm going to teach you a little bit of geology today. 120,000 years ago, Florida was half the size because sea level then was 25 feet higher than now. Pretty stunning visualization, right? That's not a made-up graphic, and it's not a computer model. That's just determined from where we know that sea level and the shoreline was 20,000 years ago and 120,000 years ago. So what's happening with sea level rise? Well, in the 20th century, or since, in fact, shown here since 1850, a century and a half, sea level has been climbing, and it does go up and down a little bit year to year. It's really hard to measure, because in the entire scope of this graph, this picture, I'm going to show you three different time perspectives. But in this image, we're showing 160 years, and sea level has risen about seven or eight inches as a global average. I, it's interesting as to why do the blips go up and down. It has to do with weather patterns, which vary year to year, and the amount of snowfall and the amount of melting and a lot of other things. Um, looking ahead to this next slide, that same eight inch, inches of global average sea level change is depicted as the red wavy line toward the bottom. Can you see that? About a quarter of the way up the chart. Well, those 13 bars are 13 cities in the United States to show you how sea level varies from place to place. So global sea level, surprisingly, is not the same everywhere. The column on the left is outside of New Orleans, 46 inches. Then Norfolk is 30 inches, New York is 14, Miami 12, and on the far right is Los Angeles at four. So how in the same period of time since 1880 could global average sea level be about eight inches New Orleans 46, New York 14, and Los Angeles 4. And the difference is because land moves up or down slightly too. And the rate of sea level change we're talking about is something like an inch a year. 
So if the ocean goes up an inch or less a year or a decade even, and the land subsides a little bit, it's either going to add to the apparent sea level rise or reduce it. So what happens is that in New Orleans where the ground is sinking because of taking water and petroleum out of the ground, plus it's on silt flats from the, uh, the delta of the Mississippi River, the land's compacting for all those reasons. And in Los Angeles where the Pacific plate, the tectonic plate goes underneath California, it has raised Los Angeles by about four inches. So a global sea level rise of eight inches appears to be only four in Los Angeles. That's why they get all the earthquakes out there. So this becomes a very holistic picture that you can see that suddenly lots of things which may not make sense. Well, how come it's not that much here? Or how come it's more here? It actually does make sense. If we step back to the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, again, we see the big picture. And three striking things come out of us from this chart. One is that, again, sea level rose 390 feet in that 20,000 year period. And it got to the present height more or less five or 6,000 years ago. Again, pretty much when we began keeping written records. And probably that accounts for why we have trouble believing it's gonna change much. And the other thing is that right in the middle there, there's a big step, two steps in fact, and that's, we call the meltwater pulse 1A, which is just a way to describe that, boy, there was a big change in sea level about 65 feet in four centuries by nature. Pretty stunning, hard to imagine that. That's a foot and a half a decade of sea level rise for 40 decades. Be hard to keep up with that. And that was in nature without us warming anything. We'll come back to this in a minute. The reason that this happens is what I said, referred to the ice ages. Now, how many of you remember reading about the ice ages in, in school? Okay, and maybe you saw the four part documentary series. Uh, um, this was part two, Ice Age, the meltdown. If you have kids or grandkids, you may have seen this. My daughter was six at the time this came out and I watched this 30 or 40 times behind Manny, Diego, Sid and Scat, okay? Behind the animals. I do this for two reasons. One is we've got to laugh about this a little bit. We've got to keep a sense of humor that the planet has changed and we need to realize what we can affect and what we can't affect and where we need to adapt and change our ways and where we need to try and change things. And I, that's really important perspective. And to do that, we need to keep a sense of humor. The other thing is it helps to remember the facts. Behind the animals, there's two miles of ice. Two miles of ice is roughly 10,000 feet of ice. That's about all I need to remember. 10,000 feet of ice in the Northern Hemisphere melted and raised the ocean level almost 400 feet. You get that science, right? You don't need a degree in geology to understand that. That's about all you need to understand to realize the relationship between ice sheets and sea level and the shoreline and real estate and investments and where we live and our cities. We took a lot for granted. We were pretty ignorant. We built cities thinking the shoreline was permanent. There's a new reality. One way to visualize this is to look at a 47 story building, which happens to be a building in Miami, but it just happens to fit the actual heights. During that peak of the last ice age 20,000 years ago, sea level was effectively at the ground floor, street level. Then over 14,000 years, it rose to the 30th floor where we are today. When all the remaining ice melts, we'll get another 212 feet or 17 floors of sea level rise. Again, that's not gonna happen in this century or next century or the century thereafter. The earliest it could happen is probably 500 years and if we slow things down, maybe we'll get 5,000 years. But it's a new reality. And again, it's, you know, is, is it sobering? Is it scary? Is it disturbing? Is it a problem? Yeah, but so is getting older and dying. I mean, we need to face things realistically. It may disturb our vision of reality just like a health crisis, but just like a health crisis, it should pro provoke us to think different and maybe do something different. And I'm gonna conclude this, there are two things we need to do differently. We need to begin adapting to a changing planet and we also need to try and slow the warming. And we gotta do them both, it's not one or the other. And I'll reinforce that in my book does and all of my materials. So let's get a quick uh, lesson of what's happening in the world. Antarctica has a lot 
of ice on it. It's seven times bigger than Greenland, so it is the biggest source of potential sea level rise. And I want to give you a quick little description of where potential sea level rise can come from. This is a photograph in Greenland I took that shows how the water is aggregating and finding these channels or chimneys to flow down to the base of the ice sheet now. And they're called Mulans. And in fact, National Geographic has had two different articles, one of them a cover story showing this incredible melt rate in Greenland. That's, that's the big change story of the, of, uh, the last decade or so. And it's very much part of sea level rise. As the water goes down, it either gets to the ocean and raises sea level, like adding more water to a glass, or it gets underneath the glaciers and allows them to ride on water instead of grinding their way on bedrock. So the glaciers are speeding, doubling, tripling, and quadrupling their speed. And as the glaciers get toward the ocean, they do add to sea level, like putting more ice cubes in a glass. I don't know if this uh, film clip's gonna work here. Let me just see if I can get this. Okay, this is showing something from 2008 yeah. in Greenland. V section right there. They were doing a film which you can rent or buy called oh, uh, Chasing Ice. It's a wonderful part. little film. Actually very All terrifying. Right? Yeah. Just showing you a scale of what's happening in Greenland that's hard to imagine. That was not in any of the models. See, look at the whole thing. I think this clip is four minutes. And we'll get back to kind of... This was a three-year project funded by National Geographic and the National Science oh. Foundation. And they had, they had 30 or 40 cameras around the Arctic waiting to show what's happening. They had no idea what they were about to film. At the start of this, the guys were saying, yeah, James, uh, they, were, they were radioing into their base and saying nothing much is happening. And then, oh, I think something's happening. And then in a span of uh, 45 minutes, the world changed. It gets worse. In fact, they really couldn't anticipate. They just have to keep panning back and expanding their field of view. No, this is real-time photography. May 28th, 2008. I saw that, I've seen that glacier. I was there in 2007, I was there the year before. That looks like a whale, it's really a dark carbon, black carbon layer in the ice that's turned upside down here. But models don't do this. Models don't show tipping points. Models don't show collapse. Models tend to be linear until we can actually... have enough examples to create a model. This has never happened in human history that we've warmed this much. The calving face is 300, sometimes 400 feet tall. Pieces of ice were shooting up out of the ocean 600 feet and then falling. try to put it into scale with human references if you imagine Manhattan and all of a sudden all of those buildings just start to rumble and quake and peel off and just fall over and fall over and roll around this whole massive city just breaking apart in front of your eyes just observers, these two little dots on the side of the mountain. And we watched and recorded the largest witness calving event ever caught on tape. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. That's the producer, James Bellog. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. That's a magical, miraculous, horrible, scary thing. 
I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. It took a hundred years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. That's the kind of uh, reality and picture that's worth, you know, a thousand words. We'd never imagined that that could happen. It's happened. That was seven years ago. Um, the planet's a degree and a half Fahrenheit warmer than it was a century ago, almost a degree Celsius. That's huge. It's a global average. In the Arctic, it's much worse because it's an averaging effect again. The, the, even when we get colder winters in the Northeast and we get more snow, we tend to look at things locally. How does it affect us? We tend not to step back and look at that you know, average picture, which gives us an apples to apples comparison the kind of statistics we look at to have an unbiased view of the facts as opposed to some anecdote. People say, oh, how come it's colder this year if it's global warming? Well, it may be colder where you are, but what about all the places where it's much warmer and the Arctic's one of them? It's out of sight, out of mind. We have other problems. We mentioned last night, for those of you that were here, the methane. Somebody brought up the question. And methane is an even bigger factor than carbon dioxide in terms of warming things. In fact, it's much, much larger. And methane is here being flared out of a lake in Siberia. There's no pipe underneath that hole in the ice there. That's just a Siberian lake with the ice sheet in wintertime capping the, or trapping the gas that's coming out of the ground underneath, the permafrost and the, the slush in the seabed or lake bed here. And uh, they're actually burning it. One person there actually pipes it into their house and uses it for cooking. That's Great use of energy, I guess. The point is the planet's changing, just as we're changing. And we need to look at a picture holistically. I think holistic is the right answer. Um, this is not the end of the world. And one of the things, I'm gonna show you a couple of more slides in a moment, but um, this is a picture I took of my da daughter and her friend a few years ago at the beach. And I said it last night, but I really believe it. This is not a gloom and doom picture. This is a picture like aging, like disease, cancer, or other things. We need to deal with it. We need to look at our options. We need to say what's caused it. What are our options to deal with it? But we also need to look positively to the future, and I really do believe that. And my daughter, who's now 14, helps me do that every day. Sea level rise and climate change is not a catastrophic event in the sense that a tornado or a tsunami or an earthquake is that we have no warning about and is gonna catch us off guard. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We now have a century of warning, decades of warning to begin to think different. And different than a storm again, which hits one area and may or may not hit, and you don't know when, you don't know how big, sea level is just gonna keep rising. It's going to keep rising for hundreds of years. It's going to move the shoreline inland. As sea level rises because of the ice melts, it means that the next storm or the next extreme high tide is going to be even higher. It has an additive effect, but it doesn't recede. So why does sea level rise? Well, it's, again, as I said from the beginning, it's not the melting Arctic. We tend to think of the polar bears. But what the Arctic does mean there's two messages I take away from the Arctic. One is, is that we go from dark, from bright white ice to dark ocean. We, it's like taking a white roof on a house and painting it black. It's gonna absorb more heat. And that's changing the temperature inside the house or inside the ocean. And that's a problem. So it's a feedback loop. But the second thing is it's a, it's a great, proof and teaching tool because people say, oh, Mr. Englander, I think that this, this has happened before. You scientists are just exaggerating at grant money and you know, you're taking this out of context. This has all happened before. I said, well, it has happened before, but it was three million years ago that the Arctic was ice-free. It's gonna be ice-free in our lifetime. If there's any confusion whether we're in a new era, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that the polar ice cap will be ice free for a few days and then a few weeks and then eventually a few months in September 
sometime in the next decade or two that it is unstoppable should be give us pause and get our attention and say, wait a minute. Sure, we have seasons and sure we have unusual storms and there's some years there's no hurricanes and some years there's lots of hurricanes and we can get earthquakes. All that's true. But the polar ice cap has been frozen for 3 million years, the North Pole. Antarctica has been frozen for 30 million years. That's geologic fact. That's not an opinion. People get confused because the peripheral sea ice around Antarctica is growing. That's exactly what we would expect to happen. It has no effect on sea level. It's consistent with global warming, surprisingly. Be glad to explain why. The facts are the facts. And the fact is that the Arctic is going to be ice-free in the next 20 years. And then it will refreeze during the wintertime, but thin ice. When I dove under the polar ice in 1985 and 1987, it was 10 feet of ice we had to drill through. That's gone. There's hardly any 10-foot ice anymore. That was the perennial year-round sea ice. Now we get thin ice building each year. Antarctica to the Arctic, it's all proof of warming. And again, you have to understand things either to not make a, a, an incorrect assumption that growing sea ice around Antarctica means the planet's cooling. It has not, that's unrelated in, counterintuitively. So I want to give you a quick uh, picture of how this all connects. The amount of sea level that can happen potentially, as I said earlier, was 212 feet. Basically, just round figures that comes down to 24 feet from Greenland and two, 186 feet from Antarctica. And the remaining two or three feet is the glaciers. All the world's glaciers from Alaska to the Alps to South America, Glacier, Glacier National Park in the United States, all of those glaciers add up to two or three feet of sea level rise. That's surprising, but it's fact. Fairly simple measurement. The big problem is the ice on Greenland and Antarctica. And the one other factor we don't think about, but is thermal expansion of seawater. The oceans are already a degree and a half Fahrenheit warmer, as I said. And as a result of that, they're about three or four inches taller because when things get warm, they expand. You know, parts in the wintertime don't fit the same way. Keys go into locks differently and things like that. Well, it's because of thermal expansion. And the oceans, because they've warmed one and a half degrees Fahrenheit or about 0.85 Celsius, they are about three or four inches taller. The rest of the eight inches we've had so far comes from Greenland pretty much and some glaciers in Alaska, et cetera. It all adds up. This is, I mean, I love going on, on uh, shows with deniers and, and people who want to spin this because uh, the facts are the facts. And I haven't been stumped in two and a half years. And I welcome going to hostile audiences because those are the people we need to enlighten and get to see what's at stake here in terms of our towns and our homes and our investments, etc. And it works because sea level is a part of climate change that's a little different and gets around a lot of the the confusion and politics that somehow become associated with climate change. The problem is when glaciers go from land to ocean, that's when sea level rises, as I showed you earlier. And the big problem is one place in Antarctica at the eight o'clock position, shown in red there. That red is to illustrate the amount of movement in the ice, basically reflects the amount of warming that's happened. And the movement in the ice is the problem. I'm going to now give you an aerial view of that same area at the 8 o'clock position called the Pine Island Glaciers, the PIG, P-I-G. Uh, we kind of sometimes use the acronym, but uh, the Pine Island Glaciers are really a problem. There's six of them. And when those six glaciers slide into the ocean, we are going to have about 10 feet of sea level rise just from those six glaciers. Won't happen for at least 20 years because when you look at them, now we have great data. We can look at those glaciers from underneath with, with remote cameras and drilling through the ice. And in a very simplistic diagram, this is what they look like. But here's the problem. Is that that big glacier, these are marine glaciers, they actually rest below sea level. And they're being eaten away underneath out of our sight faster than from on top. Because the water holds more heat, even though it's cold water, it's much with a lot more heat content than cold air, if that makes sense. And it's now eaten back about 30 miles on the underside. And the effect of that is that because these glaciers go back about 100 miles, it's a river of ice, that gravity will drive it to the ocean. 
And there's what's called a grounding line there, which is kind of where the ground comes up, the bedrock, that will, for a while, prevent it from sliding. Does that make sense? Can you see that? Okay, so the grounding line is really important. And we now can calculate that based upon the current melt rates and even some of the projected increase in melt rates, that the grounding line will, retrain, will restrain these glaciers for about 20 years. But beyond that, there's nothing to stop them. Now, they're huge rivers of ice. They're not going to slide into the ocean in one year. We don't know whether it'll take a decade or two decades or three decades. And we don't know when it'll start. It can't, I don't think it can start for 20 or 30 years. But let's say in the second half of this century that those six glaciers slide into the ocean. It's now deemed to be less than a 5% chance. Some people say it's less than a 1% chance. But the odds keep increasing because the planet keeps warming. So it's not in our lifetimes, and for some of you it may not be in your kids' lifetimes, it's certainly in your grandkids' lifetimes. We're looking at toward, in the latter half of this century and the early part of the next century. Now for some of you, maybe you don't care. Maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you don't care what the planet's like after we're gone. But I suspect for most of you in this audience, you do care. Not for religious reasons, although that may be part of it. But it's kind of our legacy and how we're taking care of this incredible system that nurtures us, that supports us. It's a different viewpoint. You can see this. It's the opposite of looking at our bodies, but certainly it affects where we live, the temperature, weather patterns, and real estate. I mean, literally the shoreline. We hadn't thought of it that way. It's a new way of looking at it. And on top of the Pine Island Glacier shown there with the dark red arrow, there's a new area that's even in some ways more concerned with that striped arrow that just popped up, the Totten Glacier. It holds 22 feet of sea level rise and has the same structure, but it's a little behind in terms of the warming cycle. But so you add the two of them up, now we got 30 feet of sea level rise. Now, the scientific community was not willing to say it's gonna happen this century, so they leave it out of the projections the way that the IPCC and the other documents that look at projecting climate change work, they try and keep themselves to what they know will happen this century that they can document, that's been in peer-reviewed literature, that they can quantify, that has a 80 or 90% certainty because they don't want to scare people. And they don't want to say things which were uncertain when it will happen. It's like saying when a, when a hurricane will happen or when a tornado will happen. We don't know. Or an earthquake, right? Or an avalanche. But there's also you know that in a certain period of time those things will happen. But here it's even more certain because we, the ice is there, it's moving, it's melting, gravity isn't going to stop, ice isn't going to melt at a different temperature than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Those things are givens. This is going to happen. This is going to affect all coastal communities on this planet in the next century or two. It's really a different reality. Can you see that? That it's, it, this isn't a weather event which is a variability and who you can't exactly predict weather a year in advance we know that but you know we build for earthquakes based upon a 10 percent risk that within 50 years we'll get a category 8 earthquake we're now worried about building we're in tsunami zones right where we're going to get a tsunami which is again a seismic event not a weather related event but we 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 have it where we've seen disasters happen like earthquakes and tsunamis we build smarter. We say, let's plan for kind of a worst case scenario, right? We're not doing that with sea level rise. And sea level rise becomes, as you can see, a really special aspect of climate change. And the amazing thing is, this is not a probability event. It's only a matter of how soon it will happen. It's sobering. I can see that it's got some of you either reflective or depressed. And I'm sorry about that. But it's just like a medical crisis. It needs to cause us to think different. And I'm going to bring you around to that in a minute, I hope. But first, let me give you the, the final graph and big picture of this. Sea level over 400,000 years has moved up and down in a pattern. Sort of a pattern. When you lay on top of that global average temperature in red and greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in green, an amazing picture becomes clear. And any of you that get into teaching this, I'd be glad to share this slide with you. It's a slide I assembled with the help of Dr. James Hansen, who's probably the foremost climate scientist on the planet. He recently retired as head of NASA's Earth Science Program. 
And Dr. Hansen has been one of the real uh, clarion voices about climate change since the early 1980s. And he, um, he'd done parts of this graph, but never assembled it quite this way, and now he uses it too. It's in my book um, in black and white, but it's easier to kind of discern here in color. The, uh, so sea level moves up and down in a pattern, temperature moves up and down in a pattern as global average, and then greenhouse gases do. And what's very obvious to see is that there are four cycles in this graph. Not exactly the same, but pretty close. And the peaks all line up. Well, why would that be? Well, green, um, greenhouse gases trap heat, and that's why the planet warms. And I'll, I know there's a few questions, I'll answer them in just a minute. So that affects temperature, and as temperature warms, the ice sheets melt, and sea level rises. So that's why those three lines move together in general. There's lag times. This is, this is 400,000 years. It doesn't happen in a year or a decade. It takes a long time to melt ice. It takes even longer to grow the ice sheets. If we were able to figure out how to stop warming the planet and got it back to its cooling phase, which is where it should be right now, it would still take a long, long, long time to get the ice sheets growing again and reducing sea level. You can understand that. It's a very, very slow process. We think a year is a long time. We think a century is forever. In geologic time, that's not even a blink of an eye. 5,000 years is considered a quick event. Now, what the information that comes, I think this slide teaches more about climate than any other single image there is. And not just because I, well, I, as I say, I'm responsible for creating it, but I want to give Dr. Hansen credit for it. But it shows the big picture. And it shows a couple of interesting things. There's a boundary. And this, we could go back 4 million years instead of 400,000 years. It would be the same picture. That sea level raises up and down about 350 feet, three or 400 feet. Temperature, global average changes 9 degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees Celsius. And carbon dioxide ranges from 180 to 280 parts per million. I, give, I round numbers off to make them easy to remember. That's all you need to remember about those numbers. And the problem is in the upper right, that little vertical green line that's circled in red, that's carbon dioxide. It's broken out of the natural range of 180 to 280 and it's now at 400 parts per million and climbing straight up because of greenhouse gases, okay? like a rocket. 40% higher than any time in the last 10 million years. The other thing I want you to take away from this slide before we move on, if you look at the end, is of course that we are at the warm spot in the cycle. And you can see that if you look at this 100,000 year cycle of climate change, of ice ages, that we probably were at the point where we would have started entering the cooling phase when sea level would have begun an 80,000 year fall toward the next ice age as the planet entered a cooling phase. We've changed things. We haven't just accelerated climate change. There is a natural climate cycle. We would call it the ice ages as one example, as a cycle, a natural cycle, that was driven by a solar variation. It happens about every 100,000 years and it's because of the, align the shape of the orbit around the sun and the tilt and the wobble of the earth. Those kind of three things all affect how much energy we get by a little bit, just like summer and winter vary the amount of energy we get, and we get summer and winter, cooler and, cooler and warmer seasons, right? Well, because of those three other factors, orbital factors, we're getting a super summer winter every 100,000 years. That's the ice ages. Natural cycle, written in the rock record, proven by sea level and the shoreline, right? But here's the problem, we've broken out of that. This liberating all the fossil fuels and the carbon dioxide, the carbon, is a very powerful insulator. It's like, it'd be like with your house putting 10 times more insulation in the attic and not turning down the furnace. The house is gonna get hotter, right? That's what we're doing. How do we know that? People say, how could you possibly know that data going back 400,000 years? Well, we have a great technology. In fact, I like to say it's a cool technology because it's the ice cores. We drilled down in the ice sheets. Sorry, that was a bad pun. But the, uh, this cool technology is that we drill down and get these core samples out of Greenland and Antarctica. And it's very much like taking a sample from a tree and get, counting tree rings and looking at what happened 40 years ago and seeing that there was a fire or there's a drought and things like that that we can do from tree rings. We can do the same thing going down in the ice core because if you look in the lower left there, that person's holding up a core sample that probably spans, I don't know, about 
15 years, but the, in the fingers of somebody in the lower right is a year of ice, that the snow gets compacted to ice and the ice gets pressurized into pressurized ice under thousands of feet of ice, miles of ice. And the bright spots there are air samples. It's a great technology. It's only been around about 20 years. And just like, it's like molecular medicine type things when they go in and we can learn things we didn't, weren't able to see before at the molecular level or cellular level, I should say. But we can get the percentage of carbon dioxide that existed up to 800,000 years ago. And we know temperature, not because of the temperature of the ice, of course, that's 32 degrees, but there's two different isotopes of oxygen, 16 and 18. And they vary in proportion to temperature because they have different molecular weights, really simple physics. And they are good indicators because this has been done now from Antarctica to Greenland, and it's been done by about 10 different countries and 10 different universities, and they all pretty much come up with the same picture. So we know this is good science. They're not colluding. They're not making up a story. And it's a great record. And it shows us how much carbon dioxide and how, much temp how temperatures change. And then we get sea level from looking at ancient shorelines that are now underwater or up above sea level these days. So all of this comes together as this picture of carbon dioxide, global temperature, and sea level or the shoreline. It's not assembled from models. It's assembled from history, from geology, from things we can measure. Now, people like to distort and they like to paint their own picture. You may have seen a graph a little bit like this or, or this one uh, or parts of it. Some people have tried to say that follow some of the blue lines. This is showing since 1970 to uh, the present global average temperature. And some people like to carve off parts of this and show that parts of temperature aren't rising. I don't know if you can see it in the back of the room, but there's a red diagonal line that spans 40 years. And there's six different, one, two, three, yeah, six different blue lines, can you see them, that follow shorter time periods. And what a lot of people who want to confuse you, I would call them deniers or people who just have their head in the sand, um, say is, well, let's look at seven years or 17 years. And if you look at that choice of years, we can draw a line showing the temperature isn't rising. Well, if you believe that, I have some investments I want to sell you. If I get to choose the time frame and say, don't ignore the big picture. Look at seven or look at 17 weeks, right? This company did great. You wouldn't do that. We need an objective, unbiased sample. Decades, multiple decades, etc. Because what you see here is there's a pattern that global average temperature has been steadily rising. It looks like a staircase. There is a there is actually some good reasons for this that I can't get into here. I explained some of them in my book, but this all makes sense if you want to step back and look at a big picture. So we know enough now that with greenhouse gases where they are and because of our energy sources that we can't stop immediately. And even if we did stop putting fossil uh, or carbon dioxide in the air immediately, if we want 100% solar now, sea level is still going to rise because the, temp the heat's already been locked in the ocean. The ice sheets are going to melt for centuries. We can slow it and we should try and do that. We really should. We should do everything possible to slow the rise of temperature. But we've got 7 billion people on this planet headed to 10 billion. And each of those people on average wants to use more energy. And this afternoon you're going to hear from um, Seth, I think is in the audience, who's going to talk to you about energy source and op options. And there's a big honest debate about whether we should use nuclear. And you heard uh, Helen Caldicott, who's an esteemed expert who doesn't believe we should use nuclear because of the health risks and so on. And that's a, a, a fair discussion to have. But I know this, the more carbon dioxide we put up in the air, the more this planet's gonna warm. And seven billion people headed to 10 billion is just a reality. Even with better family planning and all the other things that go with it. We should do those things. But we need to be realistic here. Um, there's a range to the greenhouse gas, to the temperature, and to sea level over the coming century. And if we do the right things, we can keep it on the low end of the range. But it is not stoppable, like stop it in its tracks. So for those that want you know, to, to dig deeper on this, again, I'll be out there 
selling books later, thanks to uh, uh, Steve and Brian and, and the bookstore here. But it's also available as an ebook online through Kindle, and uh, my website's for free, the, uh, the blog posts, and I give a lot of this information for free there. There's no ads or capturing names. Um, I really am trying to help people see things differently because I believe that we can see this as a glass half empty or half full. People say, John, what could possibly be the good news about sea level rise? Well, I say, first of all, it's a reality check. It is what it is. I mean, it's not, it's not what I want it to be. And the truth is, sea level changed hundreds of feet in nature. We just were ignorant. We were fooled because we, we came along at the end of a 20,000 year rise in sea level before it was about to turn the corner for an 80,000 year fall of three or 400 feet. We arrived at slack tide. You know, when you drive up to the inlet of a, of a marina and the water has been coming in as the tide rises and churns around for 20 minutes before it starts to go out. That's called slack tide. If you just pulled your car up to the inlet or the fishing dock at a, at a coastal marina, at slack tide, it would look like sea level didn't change, right? If you stayed there for the six and a half hour cycle, you'd see it go up and down three feet or whatever it does in that location. Some places 25 feet. So it's perspective and it's awareness and it's understanding and that's reality. And that's part of our learning about health for ourselves, the planet, our communities, and financial health, because the fact is the shorelines just started to move. They put in $15 million of pumps in Miami as the first phase of a $300 million program so that every 28 days they didn't get salt water on the streets, Alton Road and some place like that if you know South Miami Beach. But it's not just Miami, it's neighborhoods from Vancouver to uh, Monaco to certainly Bangladesh and Vietnam and Bahamas. It's all over the world, every coastal community in the world, community in the world. So what could possibly be the glass half full? Well, I'm, I'm going to admit up front, it took me a while to think of this because as I was writing the book and looking at my daughter as she was growing up, I said, this cannot be just a depressing story. But what's, first, let's start with reality, the truth. Let's learn, as Brian says, let's learn every day and, and get insight into, in, from facts about our bodies, about what we do to them, but about the planet too. And here are my three takeaways that I suggest to you can be the glass half full here, the positive viewpoint. That most disasters come at us without warning. The hurricanes, the, certainly the tsunamis, the uh, tornadoes, things like that, earthquakes, avalanches, we just saw in Nepal. Um, it's hard to plan for that, frankly. Here we have decades or centuries of warning that sea level is going to rise and move the shoreline inland. If we can't begin adapting to that, we are idiots. We deserve to go underwater. I mean, if you can't understand that ice melts at 32 degrees and that there's enough out there you know, to raise sea level that much, um, we're stupid. But no, we're better. We can learn. Second thing is once we apply ourselves to things, we do amazing things. We know that from cell phones to putting man on the moon to different molecular technology and medicine and things like that. We do great stuff. Once we focus on a problem and stop playing games and denial and, well, it's going to be really expensive to get off a coal and, you know, and, uh, um, you know, all these other uh, denialist delay tactics, just like we heard when we were kids, most of us, about smoking and cancer, as Margaret or Helen talked about last night, that uh, there's a vested interest by businesses to preserve the status quo. I understand that. And I don't think they're the bad guys. I think we need some simple rule changes. We need to price carbon. There needs to be an escalating cost to turning carbon into energy because carbon is the cause of the problem. There should be some kind of carbon tax, fee and rebate. There's lots of potential schemes. But there's a cost to it, just like there's a cost to cigarettes and public health and dealing with people with lung cancer. And just like we've figured that out and put warnings on and taxes and things like that to try and disincentivize people to smoke. And I think we need to do the same thing with there's in coal and solar and renewable energies and nuclear and so on because it's carbon that's causing the problem. But we can't fix it quickly. So I, I do, we're going to come up with technologies architecturally, engineering-wise, um, 
planning wise, but it's in fact finance and law and accounting. We're going to have to start amortizing coastal assets. Right now, if you have a $10 million piece of land on the coast, you don't amortize it. You treat, it's kept on your personal or corporate balance sheet forever because it's assumed to be permanent. Buildings and infrastructure are amortized typically over 30 years. In other words, you follow what I'm saying, if you put a $30 million building, a resort or an office building on the coast, the land on your balance sheet stays there. But the $30 million, you write off a million dollars a year typically, knowing that it has a finite life. Well, the land has a finite life too now on the coast. It's like leasehold. We need to realize that. It may take 100 years, it may take 200 years, but at some point we need to write those assets off. That's going to change our accounting system. I mean, so this is the most profound change that can happen to the planet in terms of the 72% that we thought was ocean and the 38% that we thought was dry land. That's going to change. There is no doubt. Does anybody dispute that that's going to happen now with what they know? No. It's not possible to dispute it. Some places like the southeastern United, southeastern United States, where we are today, are more vulnerable than others. But some places are even worse than us. Bangladesh, Vietnam, tens of millions of people in those countries. Countries that will disappear. You've heard the Maldives, Kiribati, Tuvalu, be the first to go underwater. Parts of the Bahamas, where I used to live. Miami, within 100 years or so, roughly, who knows, maybe 60, maybe 160, but will be a tiny community of islands that they've built up a few of them higher and higher and with canals, but it won't be the city that we know today. We're going to adapt. You can't, you don't have a choice about adapting to sea level rise. It's not, I mean, really think about it. I mean, if the water's around your ankles, what are your choices? You get enough, you know, you, you move to higher ground or you move or you get wet. This isn't an option. And so the first thing is we've got time to plan. The second thing is we will do some really neat things technologically once we focus on this problem and say we want to deal with this, both slowing it and adapting to it. And the third is you all have an opportunity to communicate. Whether you use my book or borrow some of my slides or just get educated about this, that's fine. This is, this is the biggest game. It's just like the issues about health in your bodies that you're here in the rest of these seminars with the real truth about health. This is a matter of sharing with your family and friends and loved ones and community, fellow investors, and of course your members of Congress because for some reason they have become beholden to people with very immediate commercial interests. And I don't hold the business community guilty. Some of them are pretty enlightened actually. But their goal is to make as much money for you as investors as they can. And that's understandable. But we now realize that there is a systemic, permanent risk to humanity if we let carbon dioxide keep escalating. This idea that we can adapt to climate change is disproven by sea level rise. In other words, there is no easy way to adapt to flooding cities. And even if we slow global warming, it's going to happen. So that becomes a very powerful tool to persuade and convince and reset our priorities. We need to create incentives for people to migrate to renewable energy. But we've got to recognize that at this point, we are going to get to at least 9 billion people, even if we did better family planning. Maybe we can keep it from being 12 or 10. And those people want more energy. So that's a sobering reality. But this is either the worst news, or as I said last night, it's actually to me, again, the glass half full could be the best news. This could be the one problem that causes us to think different, that you just can't avoid, that's inarguable. It's not, well, how come it's raining more here and droughts in California? And how come it's more snow here? What, those are fair questions, and there's a good answer to every one of those questions. But the fact is, you can't argue with that as the ice sheets get smaller and sea level rise and the shoreline moves inland, that it's going to affect real estate, the most tangible of all investments. It's where we live. 
So let's use this reality to teach. This is a revolutionary reality. Does anybody dispute that? It's a phrase I came up with. I like it. Okay, revolutionary reality. A little alliteration. This is about as revolutionary as anything gets. And it's a teaching opportunity. And for those who've been more ecological and holistic and environmental and sustainable and all those things, which are great, I hope you add this tool to your toolkit, but it also lets you think bigger. And hopefully connects a lot of the dots. Because what, as part of this teaching, what I like people to come away with is to realize there is a bigger picture and that it's not just a matter of going solar or driving a Prius or changing light bulbs or resetting the thermostat or using recycled paper or all those other very good things which I do. Those things are not going to stop climate change. Now we all need to do them but we also need to adapt. So that's why I come down to when people say what should we do? I say well we need to adapt to climate change and the most powerful manifestation or effect of that is sea level rise moving the shoreline. We need to adapt to it. And at the same time, we need to take that awareness of our vulnerability and what's at risk and work harder than ever to slow the warming. We've got to do two things. It's not one or the other. We have to do both. I really hope you join me, get the word out. I'm just one voice. I've given some of you some tools already. Um, I hope you go on from there. We need to expand the network. I think we've got about 20 minutes left. I'd be glad to, if it's okay with uh, Steve, I'd be glad to take questions, yes? And by the way, while he's coming up, I am a public speaker, I do this professionally. If you've got groups or conferences or audiences, um, I've got a speaker sheet up there on the front table. I've got business cards. Um, feel free to contact me. My website's real easy, johnenglander.net. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, so, thank you so much for what you're doing. And you're right, it's a... <laughs> Nothing is ever simple. Nothing is ever just black and white. There's always a lot of different directions going on. And I just wanted to get your take because there's definitely, in addition to everything that you're saying, which is all valid, there is some experimental geoengineering going on. There is some weather manipulation going on, which is also affecting the issue, the actually manipulating and moving the jet stream. And there's military aspects where that's one of their goals, is to be able to weaponize weather. And so I think those are things that, we, that have to be not ignored. Okay, great, so thank you. Um, let me try and deal with that briefly. Uh, geoengineering, you probably heard of geoengineering, that would be an intentional manipulation of climate or, or the planet's systems, uh, engineering the, the geo, geoscience. And, you know, people say, am I in favor? I say, well, first of all, we've been doing it. We've not just like what you're alluding to, the, the jet stream and things like that, if that's true, but, but we, we are geoengineering by what we do, our lifestyles for the last couple, burning, taking fossil fuels out of the ground and burning them was geoengineering. We've been geoengineering this planet for a few centuries now. In fact, you can make the argument since we arrived, okay? We have been changing this planet's systems. Now the question is, can we, can we counteract the forces we've unleashed by intentional other efforts? And that's really risky, but you know what? We're gonna do it because as sea level rises and as we get this heat that's gonna affect crops and more drought, um, we can't stop in a, a countries from attempting geoengineering. Now there's lots of discussions and it's a really risky business. There've been ideas from putting uh, sulfuric acid up in the, in the troposphere to uh, uh, nurturing phytoplankton in the ocean, which might not be nearly so dangerous to um, putting sunglasses in space to reflect some of the sunlight. Uh, who knows, there, there have been big studies because the truth is because of the amount of climate change that is now locked in, that is unavoidable, we are going to try to do some things. It's like, you know, being overweight, you can exercise and change your diet or you can, you know, take pills and, and do different things and some are probably healthy and some are probably not. And geoengineering is probably like that, but it's really risky because if we intentionally do something like reduce the amount of sunlight by putting filters out in space, which is one of the plans or reflectors, if we overdo it, 
we won't have enough energy. You know, and it, yeah. So, so geoengineering is a powerful subject. It's a concept, but I like to say to people, you know, we've been geoengineering. We are, geo we are geoengineering. Okay? Let's be realistic here. Now, the, I do some talks with national security groups, and they are concerned about this. And we can either be, um, you know, get into the uh, conspiracy or, or clandestine aspects of it, or the people I, that I deal with, and I, I do get asked to explain this more and more, actually are looking at it from a very honest and let's try and anticipate what's happening and understand some things. And, you know, I'm not going to, I don't know the deep parts of the U.S. government or any other government what they're doing, but I know that even in Russia, that at the Security Council for the Kremlin, and we have a videotape of one of their meetings, which they actually, and it's, it, it was three or four years ago when they were having record heat waves in Moscow. Um, countries are really looking at this as a national security risk, okay? And they are trying to figure out what do we do when cities go underwater and we get more storms? I mean, there is no simple answer here, folks. And, and we want people in national security to be thinking about this. Now, getting into whether they're manipulating it, weaponizing it, um, you know, just like we are with cyberspace, that's a whole other discussion. I'm not disputing it, but I'm just saying, let's stay focused on this, that this is a big deal and we will do geoengineering. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, a couple of things I want to address. Uh, first, I think this is not the top priority. Um, and I do think that doing small things like wind and solar and driving and, and a green lifestyle can have a large impact because we are a large number of people. Whereas the coastal line, that is a very small percentage of people that own property on the coast. Okay. Okay. Um, now, what I, um, I see with my own eyes is very easy to believe. I've been to China and I see the pollution. There's no doubt about it. Absolutely. China is putting up windmills everywhere. And solar. And solar, and doing things to counteract it. Yes, they are. Okay. I was in Hong Kong a yeah. few months ago. But as far as global warming, we've had the coldest winter we've ever had. In the it, eastern United States. Yes, if you turn on the TV. In, in this part of the in, world? In my lifetime, since when the very first day I've ever went to the beach in Daytona Beach, and I was just there in last April, the beach is even bigger. In my lifetime, I have seen no shoreline. Okay. Do you, I, you know, I'll be glad I to explain. I'll be glad I haven't to seen that. that, yeah. Okay. Is there um, another point before I answer the questions? Uh, go ahead and answer those, yeah. But do you have another question? Not at this moment. Okay, thank you. So let me deal with both of them. Sure that we can affect things by going solar and being green and so on, and there are 7 billion of us headed to 10 billion, and we should do that. But the point is still true that as greenhouse gases go for or carbon dioxide from 400 parts per million to 900 parts per million, which they're projected to do, we have a big problem facing us. So that's one. As far as you're going to the beach and seeing that the beach is bigger, beaches move naturally, okay? And when we put jetties in the water those, to get to marinas or change the coastline, we're trapping sand, okay? And there's different, we're interrupting the normal sand flow. When we built big, big buildings and, and assumed that we wanted a hotel on a, a great beach, we somehow were ignorant of the fact that over 20 or 30 years, the beaches tended to move, so we pump sand now, okay? And there are beaches that are getting bigger and some that are getting narrower. That's part of the ebb and flow of, of beaches, and it's, it's exacerbated by the jetties that are perpendicular and interrupt the sand flow. Some places get thicker and some places get thinner. You can't see sea level rise because in your lifetime it's only been an inch of sea level rise. And compared to tide change and waves and everything else, it's imperceptible. So I hope that helps. I, I just have one more question. Okay. In my lifetime I have noticed great um, fluctuations in temperature within one day. Sure. Like 20... That's called weather. Yes. But they're greater now than they have been in the past. Are okay. we studying that? Sure. And why are they greater? Well, as you warm the planet, the currents change, and the Gulf Streams moved and slowed down, and the jet streams changed, even naturally, regardless of whether we're manipulating it. And because of the, it'd be like putting a pot of water on a stove, cold water. As you turn up the heat, the patterns of, of convection change in the pot. Okay, we've all seen that. 
What's happening is that the currents are changing. So when we say, oh, look, we're getting more snow and it's colder here in New York and New England than it's been for when I was growing up. Well, yeah, but what about in the Arctic where it's 10 degrees warmer and the ice is melting faster? We tend to look at things very regionally and locally, okay? And there's great efforts. Next week, I'll be out in uh, Boulder, Colorado to the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which has been out there for 40 years and has samples and sampling systems that continuously monitor all over the world. And they're able to, in a standardized, objective manner, saying what's happening around the world, not anecdotally, why am I getting more heat here and more cold here or more rain here and more drought here, which leads us to this anecdotal type of evidence, which is frankly too subjective, okay? But we are doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the information provided. Uh, I'm a school teacher, and I want to take this back to the classroom. Great. So we need to make two changes, as you said. We got to accept this, and then we got to slow down the process. Right. What do I tell my students? Three things to help them slow down the, pro the process. Okay. Well, anything that reduces the amount of carbon dioxide we put up in the atmosphere, as well as other greenhouse gases, but anything that reduces carbon dioxide, which is going solar, uh, driving an electric vehicle, doing all of those things, be, making the house more energy efficient, all of that reduces carbon emissions. So those could be three things right there. The second thing they can do is we need to tell our elected officials, because for some reason, the elected members of our Congress are out of touch with the public on this issue. And it's happened before, and it's pretty obvious why, because there's a couple of hundred million dollars being thrown at them for their need to, to get reelected by some of the interests who don't want us to make changes. And just like the tobacco industry did 40 or 50 years ago. And uh, we need to tell our elected officials that we get climate change, we get sea level rise, and we want them to get it. And it's just that simple. And a kid can write the postcard and tell his parents about that. And, uh, and then, you know, find ways to educate others, whether it be their parents, their schools, their communities, because this is reality. And as I say, my daughter's 14. Um, I, I, in, in no way do I think she has a dismal future. I think she has a great opportunity to either help us cope with this, adapt to it, educate others, change policies. Um, that's what we need to do, just uh, like we do with other health issues. Telling my students to adopt or try plant-based diets, what are your thoughts about that? Well, certainly, Certainly, there's, there's, there's a good argument that, uh, you know, the, the cattle industry, or I guess, I think, I guess it's probably cows for both beef and milk, but um, I think it counts for 17% of the methane emissions in, in the United States. And um, certainly, you can make a very good argument that if we would get off of cow-based, uh, you know, diets, that we would reduce the warming. But here's... And, and I, so those of you that believe that, that's fine, and I support it. But here's the reality. It's not going to solve the problem. We should do it, but it's one of those seven steps or 12 steps, and that's the balance that I like to get. What I, what I think is a disservice is when we let people think that the answer is as if doing something like recycling or eating, going vegan is going to solve the climate problem. That's wrong. Okay, so we need to do both again, and that's part of that education, which is really important. But certainly getting off cow-based agriculture, both beef and dairy, will reduce the warming, but it won't reverse it. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Wait, I'm short. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. Thank you for opening our eyes and You're making welcome. us aware. And it's such a privilege to be here. I'm shrinking already. <laughs> no, you're broke. No, you've just grown in stature. <laughs> I've already shrunk three inches. Yeah. Okay, I'm. Uh, I live in Florida. I don't brag about it, but I'm originally a Bostonian. Okay. But we broke the record in 105 inches of snow. Mm -hmm. So about 10 years ago, or maybe 11 years ago, I got hurricane shutters. We haven't had a hurricane <laughs> since then. Yeah, which is a blessing. Right. It's wonderful. So I wonder if you have any uh, psychic abilities to no tell us. No psychic abilities, but uh, let me Do explain you, that. Okay, That's a great thank question. You. It gets to your question about weather variability and, and, and some of the other questions, and it's a really good question. Why do weather patterns change as the planet's warming? And you know, one, of, one of the big uh, dispute points that people say, well, how could the planet be warming if Antarctica is getting bigger? And what they're doing is showing a map 
of the sea ice around East Antarctica expanding. And it gets to why did Boston have more snow than usual in an era of warming. And this really does all tie together. Here's the simple fact. As you warm the oceans and they're a degree and a half warmer, there's more evaporation. Evaporation puts moisture in the air. Moisture in the air is going to either come down as monsoon rains, which we're getting, and we've had record rainfalls here in South Florida. In Palm Beach, they had 17 inches last year in one day. It never happened before, okay? Um, we're getting record rainfalls in different places, from the Philippines to, Boston, to uh, London, et cetera. Or if it's cold enough, we get record snowfall. Makes sense, right? Warming is not going to happen so quickly that there won't be any snow. And where there is more moisture in the air will come down as record snowfall. Entirely consistent with a warming ocean. Now, the other phenomenon that, ties, that hopefully ties this together for you and, and, and you is that, again, the currents change. We have what we call the Gulf Stream, which is the warm water coming up along Florida from the Gulf of Mexico around Florida and up across the top of the Atlantic to Europe. It's really part of a conveyor belt in the Atlantic Ocean that we call the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Current, the AMOC. And that co conveyor belt, if you think about it like that, which we only saw as the Gulf Stream, the warm water coming up the coast, is slowing and moving. It's moving position. And in fact, a recent paper just published a couple of months ago in a scientific journal attributed a four inch rise in sea level in 2010 off New England to a, a movement of, let's call it the Gulf Stream. Now, it was a temporary movement and it came back. But it's the kind of things that happen in the oceans that are really hard to perceive and seem counterintuitive with beaches being wider and so on, where you're really seeing a piece of the puzzle. But globally, again, you can now see a bigger picture. And the currents from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the El Nino, La Nina, yeah. these are fundamental changes to our weather patterns. As you warm the planet, the air currents, the jet stream, which they talk about the polar vortex, what that is is that's saying that for all of humanity or civilization or modern era, let's keep it simple, we've had the jet stream following a pattern in the winter and summer. The pattern's breaking down because we're warming the planet, so we're getting colder air coming further south because the, the clarity of the jet stream that goes from Alaska and Canada down across the northern United States and from west to east has been breaking up. So it's, why have we been 10 years without a hurricane and well, do we have to be in fear that it's going to, God forbid, be another Hurricane Andrew? Yeah, well, here's the reality that we've had stable weather for 10,000 years when you look back at climate history. Now, climate's long-term weather, okay? It's like if you're in business, you may have a good day or a bad day, but you look at a year to get, you know, kind of how you're doing, right? You, a record day or a record bad day doesn't make your year. Well, weather's kind of the same thing with climate. I mean, we can look at patterns of climate of rainfall or drought, but we look at the, mo the longer the period, the clearer the, Im the impression. What happens is, and we did, we, 2004 and five, we had a record spate of hurricanes. We wouldn't be living in Florida if we had that continuum of, of progression of hurricanes. Since then, we haven't had any. But the patterns are changing. You know, how many times, how many times do you hear in the news these days, well, that's weird weather. That's weird weather. Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Andrew are weird weather. The drought in California is weird weather. Well, get used to it. Weather is going to be weird because we are at a warming planet's going to break out of the patterns of the past. Now, climate, the ice ages were weird weather on a 100,000 year scale, right? We wouldn't have affected us in a human lifetime. We thought that hurricanes were from June 1st to September 30th. Well, that got broken down a few years ago, right? We thought that, you know, you get this much rainfall in a year, that April showers bring May flowers. That, that determines agriculture and where we grow things. I hate to say it, but we've destabilized things. Get used to weird weather. It's one of the biggest problems with climate change. It's going to affect us in our growing, and our agriculture, and mold, and, and drought, and too much rain, and, and too much snow. And it really is a big problem, and, I'm, and thank you for making me articulate that, but it's absolutely true. The weather patterns that we grew up with, when the hurricane season is, how much rainfall, what month's rain, you're not going to be able to rely on them very much anymore. And it's not me or the weather forecaster or the weather models or the supercomputer models. 
They're going to try and do that, but the truth is this system is way too complex. It's like the human body. You can't predict everything. You may know what you put in has some effect, but we all know that it's too complex a system to know under 100%, right? Well, the planet's even bigger. That doesn't stop us from learning some things. Thank you. We have seven minutes left, so a few more questions. I have uh, two questions. Is that um, on? The, I guess the easier question is, when I lived in Florida in the mid-2000s, afternoon rain was very predictable every single day for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. And now, as you say, the variability is it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, should I, is it worthwhile for me to put a well <laughs> for irrigation right now for my property and water or, you know? Uh... I, there, there is no good answer. I hate to, to okay. say that to you. All, all I, the only thing I can predict for sure is that sea level has to rise because in a warmer environment, the ice will get smaller, okay? And I'm not going back to my, my the, 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 the change of where we're gonna get the precipitation and when is not possible to accurately predict. Models are trying to, but I'm basing mine upon two things, geologic history and physics, okay, about ice melting. Okay, it's a really simple thing. I'm not using models so much. Um, but your question's fair. What should we think about for weather patterns or precipitation in a given region? The truth is that's beyond confident prediction. But I think, you know, you can look to the last two or three years for changes in pattern and try and say, maybe we'll get more of that. That's about all we know at the moment. Okay, my okay. second question is this. Um, I think the biggest way to affect change is really policy, you know, uh, because you affect whole society, yes. you know, by regulation or, or such, as opposed to, you know, a few of us recycling and doing that, okay. as, as, as you said. Uh, and I've called politicians or emailed them, and I've seen... If I you see, could shorten the question, we've got more people in five Okay, minutes. basically, I, what's the most effective way that you found to, to, to basically change these politicians' okay. opinions? You because I contact, find you, okay. that they're really fixed in what okay. they believe. Okay, you should, you should write your congressman or, or leave a phone message. That works just well, or send an email. You should also join groups like Citizens Climate Lobby or 350.org or the um, next... Jen, uh, Tom Steyer's group, I can't think, but there's groups that are working together to, to, to aggregate political will to speak to politicians, and you should support them and participate. So if these email things work, then basically, you know, when you say it's, 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 a, it's a thing we can do, and okay. write, your, write your congressman directly. Thank you. Okay, next, thank you. Next question. There's two more, I think. Or, and then I'll be out there for book signing and also, um, um, oh, by the way, I, I should say, we've just started an institute an institute, this International Sea Level Institute, brand new, got a 501c3 status, literally opened the bank account Friday. Um, if you want to find out more about it, uh, it's, it's gonna be an effort to do more of this on a global level, uh, much more professionally and full-time than I just do it personally. Yes. Okay, so um, for the record, 40% of the world population is within 100 kilometers of a coastline. Okay. And President Nasheed, who was here in Florida last year, had to move 16 islands worth of residents because of the rising sea level. Okay. So for him, it's a genuine concern. Now, you talk about policy, and I totally agree with that, and I do meet with the political leaders, but I find them, especially the Republicans, who I aim my, most of my talks to, incredibly difficult to reach. So what statistic or what little piece of information um, can we give them that's sure. the most important that'll make the biggest difference? What have you found reaches them? Well, again, I don't talk about climate change at first. I really start with sea level okay. because it sound, they're part and parcel of the same thing as you now understand. But sea level and flooding property is a different issue and allows you to open the conversation and even more and more in this, okay, well, sea level's rising or climate's changing, I don't know who's causing it. But once you get into it, like I think it's chapter six or seven in my book before I really start talking about carbon dioxide. Once you understand that sea level moves up and down 350 feet and that it is moving on what's at stake here, you, you actually start paying attention more to the climate potential and then the simple physics of carbon dioxide. If you start with that, and you know, we need to get off coal and I'm concerned about climate change or global warming, you tend to get the resistance. But if you say, are you concerned that Miami is having to put pumps in where they didn't used to, that this is happening in neighborhoods all over the world? I say, oh yeah, well, we don't know who, what's causing it. And say, so, okay, well, let's just talk about the effect first, okay? And then if they get serious about it and they realize that Miami's gonna go underwater, but it's not parts of Boston and parts of San Francisco Harbor and, and all over the world from Manila to Monaco and the Bahamas to Bangladesh, you know? I mean, literally, it's every coastal community in the world and it's up tight. It's not on the coast like a storm 
zone. Think of this, that sea level in, in South Florida doesn't hit Miami first. It actually hits west of the, out to the Everglades first where it's really shallow or low, okay? And so we, we get fooled. We tend to think it's like a storm where the waves hit. Not only does it get the lowlands and get, and, and a seawall won't matter because it's porous limestone. The water will get through the limestone and up behind a seawall, if there's limestone like in South Florida, the tropical islands where there's coral based. But on top of that, it goes up tidal rivers. Washington, D.C., Hartford, Connecticut, and Sacramento, California, and London, England are not on the ocean. They're all vulnerable to sea level rise. As the ocean goes up, tidal rivers go up. The impact zone of sea level is far broader than a storm. So it's another way to get to people because they, don't, they haven't thought that through. And my One more? My understanding is, from what I've heard, is that the Army Corps of Engineers in Florida is preparing for a three-foot sea level rise by 2025. So I don't know if you've heard anything no, like that, but I've that's heard... That's not true. No, that's a misunderstanding. The Army Corps' last study came out in 2009. They're just revising it, but the 2009 study has been used by the four counties of South Florida that have worked together to, uh, to look at sea level rise projections uniformly, which is smart. So from the Florida Keys, uh, uh, Monroe County up to Palm Beach and D Dade and Broward in between. The four counties are using an Army Corps of Engineers study, but it says that by 2060, we will get between three and seven inches of sea level rise. By 2030, we could get a few inches. I, I think it's three to seven. By 2060, nine to 24 inches. And the new update they're going to do within the next month or so is going to look out to the end of the century, and we think it'll be four or five feet, Okay. So it's an increasing curve. One of the things is it's not linear. You, again, you, don't, you, don't, you only see an inch of sea level rise now, which you can't see at the beach. It has no effect, okay? But we do know because of the ice melting that we are going to get many feet of sea level rise in the latter part of the century and into the next. That's the reality that you just can't see physically. Yes, I think you're the last question. Yes. Um, I was hoping that I could um, maybe get a videotape your answer. To this and wanted to make sure that was okay. Sure. And um, if anyone, I'd like to uh, encourage anyone out there, you know, if you're on social media to, you know, spread the word. And I've been using hashtag um, the real truth about health. That's how we get the word out there for all the messages. Thank you. And I, I noticed that you are on Twitter. I, there's a Twitter is at John Englander, just my, my name, first and last name. My website is John Englander.net, not .com, .net. There's a country music singer that has .com. Um, and uh, there is a Facebook page, so any of that's great. Thank you. Um, well, specifically, I wanted to find out about the state of Florida <laughs> and what our future holds. You had said about the rising um, water, and you were talking about Miami, but just in general, Florida, Florida real estate, um, you know. Um, yeah, this is, just, you know, it's a, it's a very valid question. Here's the two problems, well, three problems. We don't know how quickly the ice is going to melt. Is, is true, okay? We don't know whether we're going to get, by the end of the century, three feet, six feet, or nine feet. I do that because they're all equivalent to a, a meter, in effect, okay? But, and that's true. We can't know because we don't know how the ice sheet will collapse. We don't know that because just like you can't predict an avalanche, okay? You know that the potential's there. You don't know how it's going to collapse. Uh, but that's just fact. We're going to get, we're going to get 10 feet. We just don't know could be by the end of the century, but could be by the end of the next century, okay? Possible. And there's no way of forecasting that. It's not about lack of science or competence. You can't look at three miles of ice and know when it's going to collapse. If you're out in snow country and they said there's a risk of avalanche, it could be three minutes from now or three weeks from now that the avalanche happens. We understand that. There's no way of modeling that kind of snow dynamics, nor is there in Antarctica. So what could happen? Well, let's say we get four or five feet of sea level rise a century. It's not linear, it'll be, the worst part will be toward the end of the century. This is an accelerating curve. From your side, it's gonna go like that, okay? And, and because it's an accelerating curve, it's like compounding interest. That as the decades go on, the effects get even worse, right? And that's what fools us, because when we go to the beach, like the earlier lady said there in green, that you know, at, looking at the beach, the beach hasn't gotten smaller. In fact, her beach is getting bigger. Well, that's, that's fine, that's perfectly consistent. But we've only had you know, two or three inches of sea level rise in her lifetime at most. And you can't see that in the ocean. And it has no effect on a beach because the beach changes more for the sand deposition or, or erosion, okay? But the fact is, the planet has enough ice to raise sea level up and down about 
well, 200 feet now. And if you went back to the ice age part, the pre-ice age part, or when the ice age maximum, 600 feet. That's the total between the 400 feet we've already melted and the 200 feet that's remaining to be melted. Equivalent sea level rise from the ice. That's just geologic fact. So what does it mean for Florida to your question about real estate? Well, in our lifetimes, it's just going to be more and more days of flooding at peak high tides every 28 days or when a storm comes to town. If sea level raises things four inches or seven inches, it means the impact of that next storm or that next extreme tide is going to be even more. So how much land will be submerged this century? We don't know. And if you're 80 years old and no kids or grandkids and you've got enough money and it's not, a, it's not a risk, fine. You just know that you're going to get a few more days of flooding, but you know, not a big deal. If all of your investment are in that house in the Florida Keys or downtown Miami or, or some low-lying property, you know, and you are 40 years old or you've got kids and grandkids that you're concerned about preserving equity for, here's the problem is that, and why you do need to think ahead that the value of real estate isn't because of where it is today. It's because if we perceive its permanence, we believe it's going to be there forever, and we believe there's going to be more and more need for land, so the value will go up. Things are going to change, and they are starting to change. I know of at least 10 cases where people have sold real estate in vulnerable areas in Florida and moved to high ground in North Carolina or some other place and done it quietly not told their neighbors why, because they didn't want to bring the market down. Because the value of real estate has to do with our anticipation of its future value. So the reduction of value of coastal real estate doesn't require that the land goes underwater yet. It requires that you perceive there's a risk of it happening within the next couple of decades. That's what's going to change in the coming decades, and I nor anyone else can tell you when that's going to happen. That's like looking at the bubble bursting on property prices or stock prices or gold prices or anything else. It's a perception of future reality. But the difference here is that there is no person alive who can make an intelligent case that sea level will not rise, that ice will not melt in a planet that is one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer. So it's unique. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.